Hello and thank you so much for joining me. We're going to look at a video from a man named Honorado Diamante. He is a YouTuber who is really big on eternal security and uh, he's gaining a pretty decent following on YouTube. And Honorado is a good example of a very particular way of interpreting Jesus that you will come across in some evangelical circles today. Jesus very clearly taught that while we all need mercy and forgiveness, there is a conditional aspect to salvation, that we need to respond to him with humble obedience in order to be saved by him. But many evangelicals embrace grace alone theology, and they think that salvation is unconditional, and that there's nothing we have to do to be saved other than to trust in what Jesus has done for us, <clears throat> And they have several ways of trying to reconcile that theology with the teaching of Jesus. And one way some of them try to make it fit together is they say that whenever Jesus is speaking of salvation in conditional ter terms, he's really just trying to crush us and show us our need for God's grace. It's kind of like Jesus is, is like a father who tells his child to jump up and touch a spot on the wall that the child obviously cannot reach. And the father doesn't intend for them to actually reach it. He knows they can't, but he wants them to realize that they cannot touch it. And it's something like what Jesus is doing in, in many of his teachings according to this way of thinking. So, for example, when Jesus says that uh, unless our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. His point is not that we need to actually live a more godly life than the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, but what he's really saying underneath that is, you see guys, you can't do it. You can't be righteous enough. Um, and what you need to do is just realize that you're hopeless and simply trust in what I'm going to do for you. That's kind of the teaching underneath the teaching, according to this way of interpreting Jesus. When somebody learns to interpret the scripture like this, they will take certain passages, particularly where Jesus gives conditions for salvation, and they'll turn it upside down so that it really means almost the opposite of what it actually says. And Honorado Diamante does this kind of thing in the video we're about to go through. And it seems like um, one of the passages that people who think this way really like to talk about is the story of the rich young ruler. And Honorado has made a number of videos on this, on this passage. Now the words of the passage clearly contradict what Honorado believes. Jesus says to the rich young ruler to keep the commandments to inherit eternal life. And then he tells him to sell all that he has and give to the poor and to come and follow him, implying that if he does this, he will be in right relationship with God. But Honorado will make it sound as though the big idea Jesus really wants us to take away from the encounter with the rich young ruler is that you cannot keep the commandments and that nothing you do plays any role in salvation. So Jesus does not want us to believe what he actually says in, 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 the, in his teaching, but he wants us to believe something he does not actually say in his teaching. So this is the, the kind of thing that grace alone, faith alone, eternal security theology sometimes forces people to do. All right, so I'm going to go through Honorado's video about uh, the rich young ruler, and I'll pause and comment as we move through it. And at some point, Honorado is going to reveal what I think is a fatal problem with his perspective, and we'll talk about that. So this first clip is going to take us to about the 2 minute and 19 second point in the video. And here we go passage that is profoundly misunderstood 
Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler is often cited as an alleged proof text to teach that salvation is conditioned upon keeping the commandments. The Word of God says in Matthew chapter 19, starting off in verse 16, And behold, one came and said unto him, notice this, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Jesus speaking here, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God. But if thou wilt enter into life, watch this, keep the commandments. What is the intention behind the Lord's instruction to keep the commandments? In other words, why did the Lord refer this young man to the law? This becomes evident when we understand the purpose of the law specific to salvation. Romans chapter 3 verse 19 says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Why? That every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Notice this. For by the law is salvation. No. For by the law is what? The knowledge of sin. According to the word of God, the law does not save us, but rather shows us our guilt before God and need of a savior. Galatians chapter 3 verse 24 says, Wherefore the law was our savior. Is that what it says? No. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to do what? Bring us unto Christ that we might be justified how? By the law? No. By faith. All right. <clears throat> so one thing I want to address here um, is something that should be a red flag to anyone who wants to do serious objective Bible study. Notice Honorado's first move in explaining Matthew 19, 16, and 17. He does not zoom out and give us more context in Matthew 19, but his first move is to go right to Romans and also Galatians. Now, why, why does he do that? Well, the problem that his theology creates is that if Honorado stays in Matthew 19 and allows Jesus to be the teacher, he will not be able to bring us to the conclusion he wants us to reach. And that should make you very uneasy. You should already know that something's not right here. Honorado wants to convince us that keeping God's commandments is irrelevant for salvation, but Jesus directly contradicts that in the passage that Honorado is trying to explain. So Honorado cannot let the passage speak for itself and mean what it says. He has to jump to some verses from Romans 3 and Galatians 3. But then he gives us no context for those verses either. And that's a big problem also because those books have a very specific purpose and context. They are dealing with a very different issue than what Jesus is dealing with in Matthew 19. And that's why it does not make sense to just lay Romans 3 uh, over Matthew 19 like this. The issue Paul addresses in Romans and Galatians was the issue that comes up in Acts chapter 11 and Acts chapter 15. The big question is not, do we need to obey Jesus to be saved in the New Covenant? Or does obedience to God in general play any role in salvation? That's not what they're discussing. The big question is, do the Gentiles need to be circumcised and made to keep the Mosaic law in order to be saved? Do they need to become Jews and start keeping all of the regulations that you find in Exodus and Leviticus? That is the context in which Paul says all this stuff about 
faith and the law and the works of the law. It's true that salvation does not come through circumcision and the Mosaic law. It's true that the moral commands that you find uh, in Mosaic law revealed sin. But Paul's point in, in saying these things is that Jews who are circumcised and trying to obey the law of Moses are no more right with God than uncircumcised Gentiles because both the circumcised and the uncircumcised are justified by faith in Christ in the new covenant. But that is not the subject of the rich young ruler passage. That passage, the rich young ruler, is about the danger of riches, the spiritual obstacle that riches create for us. Very different subject from what Paul's dealing with in Romans and Galatians. But now consider what Paul says in Galatians 6 after he has made it crystal clear that circumcision and Mosaic law are irrelevant for salvation, Paul goes on to remind the Galatians of something that is relevant for salvation. Galatians 6, 6 to 9. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Now this passage actually seems to be dealing with an issue that is closely related to what Jesus is addressing in Matthew 19. Greed and sharing and generosity. And it says that those who are taught should share with those who teach. So Paul wants to see the church taking care of each other. And it's in the context of sharing and generosity that Paul goes on to remind them that we will reap what we sow. And if we sow to the Spirit, we will reap eternal life. We will reap it if we do good and do not give up. So eternal life, the same thing the rich young ruler was asking Jesus about in Matthew 19, what must I do to inherit or to reap eternal life? And Jesus says to keep the commandments, and then he tells him to sell his possessions and give to the poor and to follow him. Well, what would Paul say if a Christian, like say one of the Galatians, for example, were to ask him, what do we need to do to inherit or reap eternal life? And he'd say, well, you need to sow to the Spirit, which obviously includes being generous and sharing what we have. See, this would have been a great text for Honorado to bring alongside Matthew 19, rather than going to Romans 3, which is not about what Jesus is dealing with in Matthew 19. This is the kind of stuff that Paul says, at, you know, in, in, in some of his writings, in the parts where he's not dealing with the circumcision Jew-Gentile law of Moses issue. And you have to look very carefully you know, and, and just be very careful with his with his writings and, and look at what he's what he's dealing with in each passage. And um, now, obviously, Matthew nineteen and, and this passage in Galatians six, you know, there, there's they're, they're not giving us a complete picture of salvation, um, but they're both giving us teachings that are relevant to salvation and that give us a piece of the picture. And they're both very clear that there is a conditional nature. To salvation. Okay, let's see what Honorado says next. This next clip is going to take us to about the three minute and 28 seconds mark. And, uh, and here we go. Ideally, this young man would recognize his sinful condition, condemnation, and guilt before God, and consequently be justified by faith in Christ. Verse 18, he saith unto him, which, Jesus said, 
Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, don't miss this, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Blinded by his pride, this young man bears false witness literally moments after the Lord instructed him not to. All these things have I kept from my youth up. In reality, he was helpless, hopeless, and hellbound going about to establish his own righteousness. All right. So, Honorado continues to project things onto the text there in Matthew 19 that are not there. He assumes and asserts that the man was blinded by pride because he says that he's kept the commandments Jesus uh, mentions. But look at the text. Uh, does it actually say anywhere that he was proud? D does the passage begin with, and behold, uh, a rich man blinded by his pride came to Jesus? No, it doesn't say anything like that. The man seems to be sincere, you know, looking for insight from Jesus, which is a sign of humility, if anything. And, uh, and Jesus doesn't rebuke him for being proud. In fact, in, uh, in Mark's account, um, the, the account in Mark seems to indicate that, uh, that Jesus liked this man and um, that he agreed that uh, the man had kept the commandments. And it begins like this, And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So the guy runs up and gets on his knees in front of Jesus. That doesn't sound proud to me. It sounds humble. It sounds like he's willing to lower himself and humiliate himself and bring himself underneath the authority of Jesus. Nothing, nothing proud about that. And then uh, <clears throat> down in verse 20, it says, Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Is there any indication there that Jesus thought this man was blinded by pride and that he was bearing false witness to his face? Not at all. In fact, Jesus says, one thing you lack. Think about that. One thing you lack. That statement affirms that, yes, he had kept these commandments. If he had not kept the commandments, then Jesus would be lying to say that he lacked one thing. So, yeah, he'd, he'd honored his parents. He had not committed murder or adultery. Uh, he wasn't a thief. He was a man who told the truth. Um, he was trying, you know, honestly trying to love his neighbor as himself, as far as he understood that from an old covenant perspective. Obviously, he wasn't perfectly sinless. He needed mercy from God like, like everybody else. But he had lived a life of obedience to these commands from an early age. And there were people like that. You know, there, there were people like Daniel and Job and John the Baptist and John the Baptist's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Read what, read what it says about Zechariah and Elizabeth in, uh, in Luke chapter 1. These people were not perfect, but they obeyed what God said. They walked in his commandments. The rich young ruler appears to have been somebody like that, at least when it came to the commandments Jesus mentioned to him. But Jesus says, one thing you lack. You've been faithful in these other things, yes, but there's one issue that's going to keep you out of God's kingdom. Eliminate what's holding you back. Go and liquidate your assets, the possessions that your heart has become attached to. 
and use the money to help the needy and then become one of my disciples. Jesus is not playing mind games here with this guy, telling him one thing, but he really means something else. It means just what it says, friends. And Honorado and people who think like him are seeing things in, in this passage that are not there because it serves their theological agenda. And just a quick side note, I know that someone might say, well, then do we all have to sell everything that we have? Well, Jesus does not appear to expect everyone to sell everything that they have when we look at the totality of his teaching and how the church lived th this, this out in, in the beginning. Um, perhaps he wanted this man in particular to, to get rid of everything, uh, at least all of his assets, you know, the things that had provided him with uh, a, a luxurious life. Um, and, and yeah, you could say that that applies to, to any Christian who's rich. Um, but, you know, Jesus, Jesus does issue a command to, uh, to, to all of his disciples to sell possessions and uh, give to the poor in Luke 12, 33. And the church took that very seriously in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. Many sold houses and properties. Not everybody. You know, it's clear that some people retain their homes, you know, and not everybody maybe had a home that they could sell. Maybe some people rented, or maybe some people owned a home that was modest and, you know, met their needs, so they kept it. You know, but perhaps uh, it was those for whom it made sense, you know, uh, to do this. You, you got a house that's way bigger than what you need, or do you have two houses? Okay, well, sell one of them, or sell sell your house, and, and, and you know, rent a place, or Buy, buy a place that's, that's, you know, that meets your needs. And that isn't, you know, you're not living this luxurious lifestyle that's, that's you know, more than what you need. Or uh, s simplify your life. You know, if you're someone who's got far more than, than, <clears throat> than what's necessary, simplify your life. Sell possessions and, uh, and give to the poor, like Jesus said. Um, you have a big lump sum of money that you've been saving up so that you can have a comfortable retirement later in life while lots of people don't have their basic needs met right now, then empty that account out and, and use it to help people who are in need today and actually put your trust in Jesus. You know, actually trust him to keep his promise that if we seek first the kingdom of God, he will provide for us. Do, do we really believe that? So, you know, but you don't see that miracle happen for people often today in America, even though we are the richest Christians in history. We're the Christians who have the most possessions of all the believers in history. And yet you almost never see, see Christians in America put this into practice. And, 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 one of the reasons that you don't see it happen very often is this kind of teaching that Honorado is, is putting out there, which implicitly teaches people that they can be hearers of the word, but not doers of the word, and still receive a warm welcome from God on the day of judgment. All right, let's move on. And uh, this next clip is going to take us to 4 minutes and 54 seconds uh, so about a minute and a half. Here we go. Look at verse 21. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, 
who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them, and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. The righteousness that God required, he himself provided. God himself provides the perfection that was not possible for man. In other words, God does for man what man cannot do for himself. Okay. <clears throat> so um, for most of that clip, Honorado was just reading the exchange between Jesus and the rich young ruler and then between Jesus and the disciples. And if Honorado had just read those words and let them speak for themselves and let them mean what they say, then his video would actually be helping people to wrap their minds around the seriousness of our reality that being rich really does make it more difficult for us to enter God's kingdom. Um, this, this man had the opportunity to follow Jesus. He had, he, he had everything being offered to him, but he couldn't let go of his stuff. And uh, unfortunately, Honorado glosses over uh, the main point of the passage. He doesn't seem to realize that the passage means exactly what any child would see that it means the first time they hear it. And this is what is so tragic and maddening about how many people interpret the New Testament today, particularly the teaching of Christ. The true meaning is right there on the page, staring them in the face. But because they are indoctrinated with this kind of teaching, they cannot see what's right in front of them. They, they think there's some hidden meaning that they've discovered, you know, which they're reading between the lines, and they cannot see the lines. And the terrifying but necessary revelation that many evangelicals uh, in particular need to have today is that Jesus meant what he said. He meant what he said in this passage and in many others that they often learn to explain away. And that is a scary revelation to have. You know, when, it, when that first sinks in, that's very concerning and, and uncomfortable. Um, but it will change our lives in just the kind of way that our lives need to be changed. It will make us into the kind of people that Jesus was able to mold. And... Uh, <clears throat> You know, the people that you read about in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 2, you know, people like Timothy, people like Silas who go all in on this thing and, and follow Jesus with all of our hearts. That's the kind of people Jesus wants us to be. Um, but what, what a lot of us learn today, like, like what Honorado is teaching, just does not produce that in us. It just doesn't make us into that kind of, that kind of Christian. Um, one other thing I wanted to say about this clip, Honorado said at the end there that God does, does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And of course, uh, of course, everybody agrees with that. <clears throat> um, but, uh, you know, I mean, we can't even exist without God. We can't even breathe without God. And of course, we cannot be saved without what Jesus has done for us. But what Honorado does not see is that while Jesus had to do something for us that we could not do for ourselves, he also tells us to do something in response to him that he's not going to do for us. Because salvation is about a relationship with Jesus. And while relationships can be initiated by only one person, they never ever continue that way. You have to have two parties who are both engaged or the relationship comes to an end eventually. So friends, if we do not obey Jesus, then we are not responding to his initiation, and we are therefore not in a true, meaningful relationship with him. And if there is no relationship with Jesus, then there is no true salvation. All right, let's listen uh, to where Honorado goes next. <clears throat> This next clip will take us to 5 minutes and 33 seconds, so uh, less than a minute, and here we go. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God became man to die for man's sin. In so doing, he satisfied his own justice, thereby making that which is impossible with men possible for men. The moment an individual believes on Christ, trusting him alone, the righteousness required, perfect and absolute, is imputed unto them. Okay, so um, he goes to 2 Corinthians 5.21 to further support his perspective. Uh, Many evangelicals believe this verse teaches the imputed righteousness of Christ, that once you believe in Jesus, God sees you as though you have never sinned and never will sin, and that's why he can accept you into his kingdom, and it's got nothing to do with any obedience on your part at, at any point uh, in, 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 the, in the process or in your life. Um, but I think that if an honest, objective person wants to know what this verse really means... And uh, if they examine the surrounding context of 2 Corinthians 5.21, they're going to see some, some things Paul says there that don't fit very well with this way, uh, with how evangelicals usually understand this verse. Um, first of all, Paul does not say anything about imputed righteousness in this verse. He talks about becoming the righteousness of God Evangelicals tend to assume that those are the same thing, uh, but Paul does not give us that explanation here. Paul speaks of imputed righteousness elsewhere, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes, but not, not here. I think a much more reasonable interpretation of 2 Corinthians 5.21 is that the sacrifice of Jesus was intended to transform us into his image to actually cleanse us. You know, we, we become the righteousness of God in the sense that we actually become the people God made us to be and live the way he wants us to live. Jesus died to make that miraculous transformation happen in us. And that would suggest a conditional salvation, just like Jesus taught. And that understanding is a better fit with the surrounding context. So, for example, it's a better fit with the exhortation Paul gives in the verse right before, verse 20. Uh, Paul exhorts the Corinthians to be reconciled to God. Well, if they're already unconditionally and irrevocably reconciled to God because of Christ's imputed righteousness, then why this exhortation? But, but if in verse 21 he's talking about a change in our lives, then that Okay, that makes some sense. It's also a better fit with the warning that he gives us in the following verse, the first verse of chapter 6. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. He warns them about receiving the grace of God in vain. You can, you can receive the grace of God initially, but then it can all turn out to be in vain later on. Maybe if you're, you know... Uh, being derailed from the faith, or you're listening to false apostles like some of the people in Corinth appear to have been. You know, uh, you're starting to go in the wrong direction. You're in you're in danger of 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 having received the grace of God in vain. I think verse 15 of Second Corinthians chapter five is also <clears throat> uh, helpful. And it can serve as an interpretive lens for understanding verse 21. Verse 15 is very similar to verse 21 in that the first half of the verse speaks of the sacrifice Jesus made. And the second half of the verse speaks of the intended result of that sacrifice. Paul said Jesus died so that we should no longer live for ourselves but for him. So Jesus died to bring about a change in us, in, in how we actually live. So take that idea down to verse 21 now and use it as a lens. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As in, so that we might, 
we we might live for Jesus now. We might be changed and and do the will of Jesus from the heart. Look also at um, uh, chapter 7, verse 1, a few paragraphs down. Paul Paul exhorts the Corinthians in uh, w- with some verses from Moses and the prophets at the end of chapter 6. And uh, in those verses, God lays down some conditions that his people need to meet. God says that if they will be set apart for him and if they will touch no unclean thing, that he will then receive them and be a father to them. So there's that conditional aspect there. And Paul applies that to the new covenant church here. And then in chapter 7, verse 1, he says this, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. He says, let's bring holiness to completion. In other words, let's become completely holy. So maybe that's another way to talk about becoming the righteousness of God, bringing holiness to completion or becoming completely holy. Looking elsewhere in the New Testament, Jesus speaks of the righteousness of God in Matthew 6.33. He says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So Jesus speaks of God's righteousness here as something that we must seek after. James says something extremely helpful in James 1.19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So James uses the same phrase in this verse that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 5.21, only he has it in the accusative case instead of the nominative case, but it's the same phrase. And it helps us to get an idea of what it might mean in Paul's mind to become the righteousness of God. Because James speaks of the righteousness of God as something that is produced in our lives. And obviously Paul would agree with James. So guys, there is there's no place in the New Testament that actually teaches this idea of the imputed righteousness of Christ. There are verses that speak of imputed righteousness, like in Romans 4. I mean, it's, it's a very simple idea. When someone turns to Jesus in faith, God does not impute sin to them. He does not hold their sins against them, but he imputes righteousness to them. He forgives all their past sins, and he considers them righteous. They're in right relationship with him now. That's all it means. That's... It doesn't mean that there are no conditions going forward for remaining in God's grace or you know remaining in right relationship to Him. It doesn't mean you're now covered in Jesus' righteousness and you know you're now acceptable to God no matter what you do unconditionally going forward. That is not taught anywhere. That is something that a lot of us are projecting onto these these passages. Uh, that's a that's a Reformation doctrine. That is not a biblical teaching. Right, now let's watch the uh, the last clip here, <clears throat> and this is where I think Honorado reveals what uh, what is the, the the fatal problem with his interpretation, and um, <clears throat> he already hinted at it earlier in the video, and I'll remind you about it after the clip, but uh, now it's really going to come out, and uh, so we'll, we'll watch to the end of the video about uh, a minute and 10 seconds or so and here we go and the unfortunate truth is the vast majority of mankind refuses to rely solely upon jesus christ they refuse to transfer their trust to jesus christ alone the rich young ruler failed to recognize his sinful condition his inability to save himself and his need of a savior. Today, he serves as a cautionary tale to all those willing to justify themselves. 
all those who consider themselves capable of meriting God's favor. My friend, you can't be right with God without God's righteousness. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. If you are not 100% certain that you're going to heaven when you die, I encourage you to watch the video in the description below, The Bible Way to Heaven, and be saved today. God bless. All right, so um, so he says that the big problem, you know, the vast majority of humanity refuses to um, trust in Christ alone. I mean, I think, you know, that, that idea has never occurred to most people, either because they're not Christians or because they haven't been indoctrinated with Reformation theology. Um, you know, there's lots of people around the world who read the New Testament or, you know, are, are never taught this theology. They just read the scriptures and it never occurs to them, you know, this grace alone, faith alone thing. Um, I think the real problem is that, I mean, I, mean I, I know lots of people. I've known lots of people who are happy to trust in, in, in Christ alone. Uh, I have not known very many people who are willing to follow Christ in the way he calls us to. That's the real problem. Uh, the vast majority of humanity refuses to, to die to themselves and lay down their lives for Jesus as he laid down his life for us. That was not, that's a kind of a rabbit trail. Um, <clears throat> what I want to say is, you know, he, he, he says that the, the rich young ruler failed to recognize his sinful condition his inability to save himself, and his need of a savior. Uh, Honorado says that today he serves as a cautionary tale for all those who are willing to justify themselves, all those who consider themselves capable of meriting God's favor. Again, totally ignoring the subject of the passage in Matthew 19. In reality, the rich young ruler is a cautionary tale to the rich. That's what it's about. The passage doesn't say anything about self-justification. Earlier in the video, around the two minute and twenty two minute and twenty second mark, Honorado said that ideally this man would recognize his sinful condition and condemnation and guilt before God and consequently be justified by faith in Christ. So, you know, he's painting the, the, the picture of this rich young ruler as you know, he, he just wouldn't listen to Jesus and he walks off because he just he's refusing to, uh, to, to recognize, you know, what Jesus is trying to say or something like that. Well, first of all, um, while the rich young ruler thought that he had kept the commandments Jesus mentioned to him, there's nothing in the passage to suggest that he thought he was sinless or that he thought God owed him salvation uh, or that he thought he could justify himself apart from God's mercy. The passage doesn't say anything like that. Um, in fact, his coming to Jesus in the first place suggests that he had some sense that something was missing and that he needed God's help, which is why he's going to this guy that you know he believes to be a, a great teacher and a prophet of God to, to, to get help, to get insight, to get direction. You know, um, <clears throat> But it is clear that that he thinks there is a conditional nature to salvation. He's under the impression that he needs to, to do something. He needs to obey God in order to inherit eternal life. But now consider this question. Whose fault is it that he walks away from this encounter with Jesus still thinking that? Is it his fault? The, the rich young ruler, does he fail to recognize something? Was he just too proud to listen to what Jesus was trying to tell him? No, he walks away believing exactly what Jesus said. He asked a straightforward question to Jesus, and Jesus gave him a straightforward answer. It is Jesus who teaches him a conditional salvation. It is Jesus who tells him he must do something to inherit eternal life. 
Honorado makes it sound like it's the rich young ruler's fault that he believes he needs to do something. But Jesus is the one doing the teaching here, not, not the rich young ruler. So you see, on Honorado's view, Jesus misleads this man. And he misleads everyone else, like myself, who takes Jesus at his word. And this is what this strange perspective ultimately does. It turns Jesus into the problem. Honorado may not realize that, but the fact is that he, Honorado, thinks that the words of Jesus here are incorrect and, and lead people to the wrong conclusion if they take it to mean what it says. Do you see how insane that is? That if you repeat the words of the Son of God and tell people that they are true and that they mean what they say, that you are leading them to hell? How can that possibly be right? Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 that if anyone does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, that person is puffed up and knows nothing. Now there's a context there that needs to be taken into account, and I encourage you to go and read it carefully. But I think there's a principle there in 1 Timothy 6. The words of Jesus are sound. They are correct. They are true. They do not lead people to the wrong conclusions if taken to mean what they plainly say. But Honorado and those who think like him do not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ that are found in Matthew 19. If you tell them what Jesus said, that we must obey God's commandments to inherit eternal life, and that those who are rich and living in luxury need to make a big change if they want to enter the kingdom one day, they will not agree with those words. They will even potentially, and some, you know, some, some people will call you a heretic for repeating the sound words of Jesus Christ. I mean, this is just, it's amazing that this even needs to be discussed. I imagine some of the early Christians you know, talking about how Paul said that false teachings would arise within the church. And I imagine, and I imagine a group of them speculating about, you know, what some of these false teachings might be and how, how strange and convoluted they might become. And one of them says, you know, what, what if one day it's so bad that people actually think that Jesus' words will lead people to hell? What if people start thinking that Jesus actually meant the opposite of what he said, and that if you think he meant what he said, that you'll, you'll, you'll be going in the wrong direction? You think, you think the deception could ever get that bad? And they all think about it for a minute, and then finally they all go, no, no, of course not. Surely it couldn't get that bad. Who could ever believe something like that? Guys, it is that bad today. And it makes you want to pull your hair out because those who are indoctrinated with this perspective are often so confident. I mean, Honorado is so confident in what he's saying. And he's very intelligent. And he makes his videos in a very compelling and intelligent, confident way. It's probably very compelling for the people who, who listen to him. Um, and it's like, there's just this thick wall around their mind that seems impossible to penetrate. Honorado, if you see this, I understand something of what it would cost you to abandon this theology that you're trying to spread, which is only a few centuries old, and if you were to allow Jesus to be the teacher. And I know that it is almost impossible for that to happen at this point. In fact, I think it's safe to say that it is impossible. However, with God, all things are possible. And I have hope that somehow you might get untangled from this twisted way of understanding God's word and that you'll start preaching the true gospel, the gospel that Jesus and the apostles preach throughout the gospels and the book of Acts, including Paul. 
that God's kingdom has arrived, that Jesus is Lord, that he died and rose again. All who believe in him, that is, all who embrace his authority and become obedient to him from the heart, are forgiven for every sin they've committed and will be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that Jesus will return to judge the world and give to us all according to what we have done and that only those who obey him will enter his kingdom. That is the message, Honorado. That's the message that brings both joy and hope and also fear and trembling. And we desperately need all of that today, especially, especially today where so many profess to believe in Jesus are so complacent and casual. Tell people that message and teach them to believe what Jesus said rather than teaching them these clever ways to explain it away, use your platform and your influence to make disciples who obey everything Jesus commanded. And instead of you know spending all this time trying to defend eternal security, where does the Bible command you to do that? So do that. You know, teach people to obey what Jesus commanded. Do that, and you're you're probably going to lose a lot of your following. But you might just spark a movement that will look something like that beautiful church we read about in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. So Honorado usually ends his videos by, um, by saying that, you know, if you're not 100% sure that you're going to heaven when you die, please watch this video that he puts in the description. I want to end this video, my, my video, uh, by encouraging you, whoever you are, that if you are 100% sure that you're going to heaven no matter what, uh, please consider the possibility that um, you've been misled. And I encourage you to pr just pretend that you've never heard any of this stuff before, you've never learned any theology, never been to church, and to just begin again in Matthew chapter 1 and try to read the New Testament with fresh eyes and as you move through it, ask yourself, what would you believe if you had never been taught any of the theology that you believe today and you just read what Jesus and the apostles say? And try to read Paul's letters in their Acts 15 context and look carefully at what Paul says when he's not dealing with the Jew-Gentile law of Moses issue and consider his behavior, his way of life, his sobriety, his great concern for the believers. And, and ask yourself, why was he so concerned and regularly warning the churches um, while those who profess to follow his teachings today are often so unconcerned and so casual and presumptuous? There is a disconnect there. There's something he was seeing that people who focus so much on his letters today aren't getting because they don't act like he acted they don't they don't talk like he talked in reality if we are not walking in humble obedience to Jesus then any assurance we have is an, is an illusion and the only path that leads to entering God's kingdom at the judgment is the path of walking with Jesus in a master disciple relationship like Paul did. And Jesus died and rose again to bring us into that relationship, but he is not going to have that relationship with himself for us. All right, thank you so much for taking the time to listen. If you're someone who is starting to realize how badly we have been deceived today, and if you would like to talk, please feel free to send me an email or a, a, to call me or sh shoot me a text. My Contact information is in the community section of my YouTube channel. Please like, share, and subscribe if you appreciate this kind of content. May God help us to believe the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and more importantly, to put them into practice, and therefore to build our house on the rock, as he says at the end of Matthew chapter 7. God bless you.